Hey y'all, Scott here, and x x read all about it. E3 2017 looms. Turns out the newspaper industry was struggling so hard they let virginity reign supreme, and now we're getting front page headlines like this now. As a fan of the video game industry, E3 is one of the greatest times of the year. Even though they're referred to as press conferences, the presentations at the start of the show are so much more than that. Events like CES have press conferences, but it never feels like the companies are trying to win the event. At E3, all the companies are trying to one-up each other, which leads to jaw-dropping announcements nobody saw coming, or announcements to appease fans everywhere. However, E3 back in the day was more so CES, but for games. E3 1995 was the first show held in the event's history, taking place from May 11th to the 13th. The big three that had a presence at the show were Nintendo, Sony, and Sega, with 3DO, Atari, and numerous third parties joining them. 3DO's conference was a crock and a half. They mainly focused on their upcoming console, the M2. It was cancelled in 1997, but check the swift graphics it could pump out. God, I'm sorry, it was just so real! It was like I was really watching a video of a pre-rendered cutscene! One of the most annoying things about this conference to me was the fact that they showed off these graphical demos and then at the end, showed them again! You see, these demos were all a part of one video, they transitioned into each other, but the presentation shows the demos edited without the transitions out of context and then they're all like, and now check this out, and it's the same demos we saw beforehand, just uncut! As I previously stated, it's pretty obvious these are pre-rendered demos and not actual gameplay. This is a practice that's been happening since the very beginning, so don't act like only recently game developers started doing this. Also, I like how the 3DO guy brags about how much porn is on the console. I've been thinking of a brand new rating system based on how many knee slaps I give something, so we might as well try it out. Out of five knee slaps, I give 3DO's conference a... <laughs> Nintendo had to delay the Nintendo 64, then name the Nintendo Ultra 64, by a year, so in place of their big new console, they talked about piracy. Literally just piracy. They said the Virtual Boy was coming out, basically holding everybody over until the N64, but fundamentally, their entire conference was former chairman of NOA, Howard Lincoln, talking about counterfeit cartridges and devices. This uh, innocent looking thing is known as the video game copy, a machine to make Software. That was it. So Nintendo showed off a few SNES games like Killer Instinct, Donkey Kong Country 2, and Earthbound, while also showing off the Virtual Boy, so they had some good games to show off, but it was definitely lacking. E3 1995 was an infamous E3 for Sega, as it emphasized their slow spiral into, we're scrimp! Honestly, their conference was leagues better than 3DO's or Nintendo's, and it takes a lot to be better than porn brags and bootleg finger wags. Sega actually showed off a fair amount of games, even showing some affection for the aging Sega Genesis, announcing Comic Zone. We have hot new products awaiting launch on all our platforms. It's just a sampling of this. Let me mention Comic Zone. But it was all about the Sega Saturn, and Sega announced it was available now for $399. Not one of the smartest tactics around. We started our rollout of Sega Saturn yesterday. We're at retail today at 1800 Toys R Us, software, etc., and electronic boutique stores around the U.S. and Canada. Our retail price is between $399 and $449. This angered retailers as this gave them very little prep time or time at all to get consumers excited or even to inform consumers, which led the Saturn down the road of nobody knows this console exists. It was one of the most infamous events in Sega's career in the console business, but the conference could have been far worse. Sony's conference felt like it flew right by. To be fair, all of these conferences are only around 20 to 30 minutes, but the majority of them dragged. Sony's was pretty quick, even though it was just about 20 minutes of look at us, we're Sony, we sell concrete matter, and even the Walkman. Camcorders the size of a paperback? Okay, let's get this done. The show is basically Sony explaining why they're entering the games industry, popping up a sizzle reel and then giving Sega a solid lick to the chin with the announcement that the PlayStation would retail for $299, 100 bones less than the Saturn. Sony Computer Entertainment Presidents of America, Steve Reyes, join me for a brief presentation. Two ninety nine. dollars 
Yikes, this was back when game companies were feisty with each other and didn't mind getting aggressive. Nowadays, they have respect for each other in chunk. I mean, that's nice, but you kinda want a 299 moment every now and then, you know? Atari didn't have a huge presence at the show, as everybody had already basically written them off. However, they did show off the Atari Jaguar VR, which never came to market. E3 was obviously less about the fans back in the day, and felt more like an investor's meeting. Of course, the press conferences weren't streamed or broadcast anywhere for fans to watch, so the shows were obviously going to be a bit on the dry side. To put it lightly, I think it's pretty neato to see where E3 all started, and I have no doubt in the future we'll be taking a look at E3s to follow. And I hope you all look forward to my live reactions to E3 2017 being uploaded right as we speak, as I'm reusing my old live reactions from E3 2014. What? Classic me. Me being me. That's me for ya. The lovable show Scott! Hey y'all, Scott here, and... Well, this is awkward. Let's put an end to that. This here is a state-of-the-art, it's that time machine. It formulates a topic that's embarrassingly topical, so you always have something trendy to converse about. Looks like it's forming something now. Oh, that was lame. Don't get me wrong, I love talking about E3 1996 and October 2017 as much as the next guy, but... Come on, 97 and 98 are way in these days. But that kind of got me on an E3 1996 kick, so let's talk about the second annual Electronic Entertainment Expo. E3 1996 is one of the more important E3s that never happened, and I say this because this is one of the harder years in the event's history to find footage from, yet it contains a good bit of the major events in gaming history. Now that's in terms of all the press conferences though, the only one that is clearly available is a good chunk of Nintendos with only a little snippets from Sony's and like no others. So while with my other E3 episodes we mainly just looked at the conferences, with 96 we'll be taking a look at each company's offerings on the show floor as well as everything we could gather from their press events and see how many knee slaps out of five they deserve for their showings. E3 1996 started on May 16th and ended on May 18th. And this this was a big year for everybody, which is what everybody says relating to every E3, but this time it really was. The Sega Saturn was already considered a train wreck, so Sega had to prove the worth of its new flagship console. Nintendo had the Nintendo 64 on the way, but the system experienced numerous delays, so at this point, Nintendo really had to show off why this thing was taking so long. Also, the Virtual Boy was discontinued in North America a few months before the show, only after seven months of being on the market, so with the Virtual Boy being you know, the Virtual Boy, Nintendo had to bring the goods. Sony, however, was experiencing quite a bit of success with the newly released PlayStation. They now had to prove it was a growing console with a bright future ahead of it. Nintendo came out swinging at this year's E3. Their conference mainly focused on a demo of Super Mario 64. Now, the crowd doesn't go bonkers, but you can tell they're watching in awe. This was a great demo showing off just how special the N64 was. We have this promotional VHS tape to look at though, which was made for press and investors. I don't believe this was supposed to be shown to the public. A lot of it seems like it could have been, but at the very end, the video talks about how much money Nintendo will sink into marketing, so I'm gonna assume this wasn't readily available to consumers. The first thing shown off is a scissor reel of upcoming Nintendo 64 games, and this is really interesting. Not only is it a ton of heavy hitting titles, but it's just cool to see early builds of these games with temporary titles and logos. Kirby's Air Ride was originally a very early Nintendo 64 game, which I always found very interesting, and Star Fox 64 had a logo more akin to the SNES original. Speaking of the SNES, Nintendo hadn't forgotten about that sucker because they delved deep into the titles launching in 96, including Mario RPG, Tetris Attack, Kirby Superstar, and Donkey Kong Country 3. Not a bad lineup for a console on the way out. They also announced a revision of the original Game Boy, the Game Boy Pocket. 96 was an incredibly busy year for Nintendo, and that is exemplified by this marketing budget section at the end. Nintendo has a great lineup of second half Super NES and Game Boy games backed by the power of the Play Loud advertising campaign. Nintendo Power Source Online reaches opinion leaders to get the news out fast on hot new releases. The tiny little Game Boy Pocket gets a great big six million dollar campaign. Whoa, 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 what? Let me tell you, this guy can sell me anything. In-store merchandising and interactive displays are the keys to announcing the arrival of new releases helping consumers get hands-on experience with the hottest games ever. Nintendo announced that the Nintendo 64 would launch that September for $250, and honestly, that's not bad. Overall, a really good show from Nintendo this year, a metric eight gallons worth of awesome games and spread out across their three consoles at the time. This is definitely one of their better showings.
Sega really had to bring its A game at this E3 after the abysmal launch of the Sega Saturn, and gosh damn it they tried. They brought a lot of heavy hitting titles, Knights into Dreams, Panzer Dragoon 2, Fighting Vipers, and the big one, Sonic Extreme, the game that was supposed to save the Saturn that was cancelled hard. Sega announced a price cut for the Saturn from $399 to $199 after Sony slapped them in the face with a $299 price announcement for the PlayStation ID3 1995 and then proceeded to announce a price cut to $199 at this year's. Sega did a decent job at trying to bring the Saturn back to where they wanted it, but failed to make as big of a splash as they desperately needed to. Third party support wasn't nearly as strong as Sony's offerings, and the lineup paled in comparison to Nintendo's. E3 1995 may have been the beginning of the end for Sega as a first party, and E3 1996 didn't bode that much better for them. Sony decided that Sega wasn't dead enough, so they decided to announce a price cut for the PlayStation. Originally starting at $299, which absolutely obliterated the Saturn's launch price of $399, Sony announced a cut to $199, which in addition to showing off games like Crash Bandicoot and Twisted Metal 2, truly showed off how serious Sony was about the gaming industry. They were willing to play hardball, which Sega definitely was starting to see. And that was about it for Sony. They showed off some big titles and dropped the price of their console. Not much to talk about, because one, their full press conference was eerily hard to find, and two, they really didn't have much writing on them. They were doing extremely well already and just had to keep up the momentum, and they did just that. <laughs> E3 1996 was a really cool show. 95's show was much more based on hardware, and even then it didn't seem like companies had many games to show off. This year was all about the games, and while it must have been incredibly exciting back when it actually happened, this E3 was still really fun to look back on just because of the sheer amount of games announced and on the show floor. Games that were to become instant classics, games that never came out, games in their early stages, this E3 truly had it all, both at the time and retrospectively. E3 1996 was pretty cool overall, and... Oh, that must be the some guys talking about E3 1996 and October 2017 alerts. Let's be honest, if you're talking about E3 1996 right now, you, sounds like you're up to something. Yeah, I don't blame them in the slightest for being wary of me. Hey y'all, Scott here, and... Well, I'm stuck here for the foreseeable future. I don't want to slip and fall and have to file a lawsuit against Scott Wozniak, so why not take this opportunity to talk some E3 1997. E3 1997 was held from June 19th to the 21st in 1997 at the Georgia World Congress Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Now that's a wee bit different from the majority of the other E3 events, as most of them are held in California at the LA Convention Center. And great stories generally don't start with the year was 1997 in Atlanta, Georgia. So many may assume that this year's E3 was much smaller than previous years, and with that I shoot out a simple anti-yikes this was a solid E3. Every major company brought at least some major stuff. It was a year featuring some of the most iconic and greatest games of all time. And Sega was there too. Even if some games weren't playable at the event, footage was still shown off of them, or they at least had some type of presence. Like with 1996, footage of any sort of press conference is either non-existent or harder than hard to find. So let's take a look at the show floor along with the games each of the big three companies brought. Well, 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 after Sega stumbled through E3 1995 and 96, surely they must have had a great showing this year. We can easily see if they did or not with the aid of everybody's favorite brochure from E3 1997, the Sega E3 1997 brochure. This was given out during the event and includes basically Sega's lineup for the year. Heading into 1997, we decided to ask a lot of people what they would do if they were in charge of Sega. The overwhelming answer, make more great games. So we did. Sonic is more determined than ever to strut his stuff in two new games for Sega Saturn, and joining him is a huge cast of characters, including the iconic characters Quake, Duke Nukem 3D, and Panzer Dragoon. I forgot how much I love the mascot Quake. More games and the power to play them, that's what today's demanding gamers crave. Oh, no way! Blockbuster exclusives like Fighters Mega Mix and Sonic Jam, eh? Bit weird highlighting Sonic Jam as an exclusive since it's a compilation of the Sonic games on the Genesis, but whatever. In 1997, Sega Saturn continues to turn it up by delivering more games, more innovation, and more power to thrill throughout the year and beyond. Yeah, keep telling yourself that. Turning the page, we see the most infamous Sonic title on the Saturn, Sonic R, a racing game. Dizzying trails to blaze. Sounds about right. And five hidden characters to challenge. Beat them, then become them is the sickest possible way to save five unlockable characters. We also have some early box art, which looks miles, miles, miles better than the final one. Next is Sonic Jam, a really cool compilation disc featuring Sonic 1, 2, 3, and Knuckles. And we can see here Sonic Legend rages onto the ultimate black box. 
I'd like to ask the writer if they want another crack at that. Fighters Mega Mix, baby, the best Sega Saturn game. You can fight as a fucking Daytona USA. This brochure definitely shows that the Sega Saturn had a healthy supply of solid exclusives, just not one big one that got everybody excited. Panzer Dragoon Saga, Saturn Bomberman, Die Hard Arcade, a lot of quality stuff here. Just not enough to combat the PlayStation or Nintendo 64. Uh, sports games in 98, come back to me in 10 years and you'll see what sports games can truly be. Sega was really flaunting the Netlink, an accessory for the Saturn that allowed it to access the internet, services ranging from simply browsing the web to checking email to playing games online back in the mid 90s. Now that is impressive. Sega was truly ahead of the time in many cases. We have a section showing off peripherals for the Saturn and they warned not to play at home without a controller, good thing they told me. We also have the mission stick, the only Saturn peripheral worthy of a yeehaw at the end of the description. Sega was still supporting the Genesis back in 97. The Saturn wasn't doing too hot here in North America at all, so Sega had to make sure the Genesis was still in the picture. It's weird that they were advertising a Sonic compilation for the Genesis when their big title for the Saturn that year was... A Sonic compilation? Genesis Mega Hit series delivers classics for a new generation. What? Oh, ho, 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 f that. Game Gear and PC games are next on the docket. Sonic Blast, multiple levels of proven side-scrolling adventure, and that is what's written when you have absolutely nothing to say. Sega really supported their games on the PC back in the day, it's pretty crazy. It's mainly sports and racing games, but there's also titles like Virtual Fighter 2, Enemy Zero, Sonic 3D Blast, and Sonic Schoolhouse. Sega University hires Hedgehog, what the hell are you talking about? You own him! I also have this third-party brochure, which is basically a less detailed, shorter piece showcasing the third-party releases on the Sega Saturn. So Sega showing was pretty decent. They did show a fair amount of life in the Saturn, and a fair amount of these games are quite good. However, they lacked a big, heavy hitter, and instead supplied a lot of good stuff in the B-tier range. E3 1997 highlighted a major problem with the Nintendo 64, a lack of games compared to the competition. Nintendo only had a few titles on the show floor, the majority of which were titles from Rare. Banjo-Kazooie and GoldenEye 007 were front and center in addition to Conker's Quest, a kid-friendly 3D platformer that was generally labeled as good, if a bit too similar to Banjo-Kazooie and Super Mario 64. That game later transformed into the adults-only ROM Conker's Bad Fur Day and moved to make the game stand out more. GoldenEye was a huge hit with its four-player multiplayer, and Banjo-Kazooie was seen as a solid alternative to Super Mario 64. The only Nintendo-made game that was playable on the show floor, however, was Star Fox 64, which was releasing in North America about a week from the event. Alas, the game on everybody's mind was Zelda 64, later known as Ocarina of Time. Not playable at the the event, but footage of it was shown alongside F-064, later titled F-0X. And that's about it. Overall, like I said, this E3 really showed off the N64's problem, even though this was a year filled with some of the most memorable games on the platform. GoldenEye, Banjo-Kazooie, Star Fox, and even with Conker, that's one of the biggest cult classics in all of gaming. And yeah, Zelda was a no-show, but it was still there. Kinda. Another no-show was the Nintendo 64 DD, the Japanese-only disk drive add-on for the system. It was stated that they were too busy preparing software for the device and it would launch when it was ready, and man, that is reassuring. Overall, a pretty light year, but still a quality one. E3 1997, the PlayStation was in full force. Not only were big bombastic sequels to previous successes coming out, such as Crash Bandicoot 2, Twisted Metal 2, Tomb Raider 2, and so on, but new faces were in town in the form of Parappa the Rapper, Blasto, and Medieval. Not bad at all. The much anticipated Final Fantasy VII was playable alongside Castlevania Symphony of the Night, but the big announcement of the show was Konami's Metal Gear Solid. While only a trailer was shown, it was a huge announcement and solidified the PlayStation spot in the industry. The fact that Sony was already pumping out sequels to their games while also being the new home to franchises that were once always associated with Nintendo, this was one of Sony's biggest E3s in terms of quality, quantity, and presence in the industry. Sega showed that a company can be competitive with Nintendo, but Sony proved a company can oust them. Overall, E3 1997 was a huge year for the Expo. While Nintendo and Sega had pretty decent showings, Sony hit it out at the park. Other big announcements included the original Half-Life and Fallout, truly a monumental year. As I said, this was the first year in Atlanta, and many people were pretty peeped about it. It just wasn't that great of a location for E3, being poorly laid out compared to the much more accessible format of the Los Angeles Convention Center of previous years. 1998 would return to Atlanta, but after that, most E3s took place in Los Angeles. Well, that was E3 1997. 
1997, but I think this event deserves a bit more of a look-see. You see, Sega had a wide variety of sports games available in 1997, but no football. They tackled it with the NFL 2K series a few years later, but why wouldn't they make a football game in 97? A classic case of development hell, that's why. You see, I have this theory that Sega Sports was working on a football game to be released in 97, but it kept on getting delayed and delayed due to the sheer girth of the project until it eventually got cancelled due to the incompetency of the developers in 2006, and then our friendly neighborhood EA picked up the rights to the groundbreaking Sega Football 98, retooled the year to 08, and changed it to EA's own franchise. And now, ladies and gentlemen, may I shock the world and reveal the missing Sega Sports game in 1997 turned out to be... Could it have been anything else? Hey all, Scott here. Ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be a building, so I went to City Hall and pouted until they gave me what I wanted. Say goodbye to those human years because I am legally considered a building now, which means I can get reviewed on Yelp. Uh, oh, uh, somebody said I need to work on my conversation starters. E3 1998, right? Legend has it that 20 years ago in the distant region of Atlanta, Georgia, the event known as E3 1998 took place from May 28th to May 30th. E3 wasn't always this big live-streamed thrill ride of disappointment. Starting with the first event in 1995, the early years of the show really highlighted the fact that E3 was a trade show for the press. Press conferences weren't loud ear seizures with flashy trailer after trailer, they were like investor meetings. Lots of graphs, data, PR talk. Afterwards, journalists would visit each company's booths on the show floor, check out videos of upcoming releases, play demos, and Kodak momenting models hired to advertise f***ing gex. While E3 1998 was still a continuation of what E3 was like in its early days, the event grew substantially compared to the previous year, going from 40,000 attendees to 70,000. This made it pretty apparent that E3 was becoming so much more than just a trade show, rather an important event every year for fans of video games. 98 was a pretty monumental year for the event, just a huge amount of games, some hardware, some infamous reveals, and a whole lot of Sega being Sega. It's the E3 we've come to know and love. Well, you know the drill by now, let's take a look at each major company and their presence at E3 1998 while rating them on a scale of 1 to 5 knee slaps. I love me some incompetency, and Sega just nailed it in this era! Each E3 we've looked at up until this point, they've just been floundering almost every opportunity they have had to make the Sega Saturn look good, here's Sonic R instead! To be fair, E3-1997's lineup wasn't bad at all, they actually brought quantity and quality to Saturn's library. Nothing to make anybody go, one Saturn please, but decent enough to appease current owners of the system. But then president of Sega of America, Bernie Stoller, just couldn't help himself and spewed out the Saturn is not our future. At least they were honest. E3 1998 was important for Sega as it was their attempt at a major comeback with behind closed door presentations of the Sega Dreamcast, Saturn's successor. The console was actually officially unveiled at the Sega New Challenge Conference in Japan a whole week before this E3. Sega of America took E3 1998 as an opportunity to announce that the Dreamcast would be coming stateside in fall of 1999, with the Japanese release being fall of 1998. Only tech demos were shown off at E3, with photography of any kind being prohibited. But the press was definitely impressed by the sheer power the console was set to have. While the Dreamcast was a big part of Sega's presence at the show, the fact that it wasn't publicly shown at all and the lack of actual games being announced for the system definitely lessened their impact compared to Sony and Nintendo, who both brought a national park's worth of games. But if you're a video game fan, Sega's got you covered with all these nothing. Sega displayed Panzer Dragoon Saga, House of the Dead, Burning Rangers, and Enemy Zero all for Sega Saturn. These games had all come out at this point. But hey, at least Sonic R has come to PC. The Sega Saturn was obviously on its way out, and while Sega's future console seemed promising, they had no games, both in terms of their present system and future system. No Dreamcast games were shown, only tech demos. While the system impressed many, Sega as a whole wasn't looking too good. With E3 1997 being a relatively smaller showing from Nintendo, many were asking, Holy sh are you guys seeing this? New Zelda, new Game Boy, new Mario RPG, new Earthbound, Pokemon? I let my non-existent children get corrupted by that game. This is incredible. I think it's fair to say 98 was a huge year for Nintendo with Ocarina of Time headlining it. 
Finally, after being referred to as Zelda 64 for so long and being prude with the details, they blew the lid off of this game. Wow, it's E3 memorabilia spotlight o'clock. Ocarina of Time wasn't initially planned to have a gold cartridge, but luckily during a press event, somebody asked Nintendo of America CEO Howard Lincoln if the game would ship on a gold cartridge. He mistook the question for will the game go gold, as in will it be finished, so he answered, yeah. Next Generation Magazine decided to rub Lincoln's nose in the misunderstanding by publishing an exclusive edition of their June 1998 issue, only available at the E3 1998 convention. There were only around 5,000 copies produced with this exclusive cover featuring a shiny gold Zelda 64 cartridge. As Mike Micah, a former Next Generation employee, put it, it was basically a way to remind Nintendo what was promised, and blam, what do you know? This issue was a really cool part of my collection, especially considering it was only available at E3 1998. It has a huge feature about Ocarina of Time and other spotlights on major games at the show. Lightning reflexes as well as a good head for exploration are what it takes to lead Zelda to victory. I love video games. The article consistently still refers to the game as Zelda 64 and also dishes on the supposed expansion pack for Ocarina of Time to be released on the Nintendo 64 DD. Since this issue was fairly limited, let's check out if it's a hotly desired item. Really shouldn't have spat in this to mark my page. We got Paper Mario shown off simply going by Mario RPG, and I always found it weird how they were originally developing Paper Mario as a full-on sequel to Super Mario RPG just because visually the games are so different. And Earthbound 64 was here, oh yeah! Of course us non-Japanese players know this game as that one game we're not allowed to play. Yes. This is Mother 3. It was obviously planned for a North American release initially and had quite a bit of work done on it. However, after development issues, Mother 3 on the Nintendo 64 was canceled and later revived as a 2D Game Boy Advance game. It's still really cool to see the game in this form and it makes me think if there's a possibility that Nintendo would remake the released version of Mother 3 in the style that it was originally planned to be in. That's f***ing ridiculous, next game. Pokemon Red and Blue were coming stateside after seeing incredible success in Japan. 12 Tales Conquer 64 made a reappearance, and the Nintendo 64 DD was anti-announced to be launching in 1998 for here in North America. They said it wasn't happening that year, which implied that it was likely never making its way over. As a way to make up for it, Nintendo announced War on the Colorblind with the introduction of the Game Boy Color. Easily the most requested addition to the Game Boy lineup finally happened. Sure, the screen was still not backlit, but hey, we got full color. Definitely a step in the right direction. I guess as a way to make up for the lack of a backlight, blam! Game Boy Camera, Game Boy Printer. It's amazing how much support the original Game Boy was getting in 1998. This was a great E3 for Nintendo. 97 was a bit lackluster, but now it's obvious they were just taking a year off for this massive blowout. The sheer amount of quality exclusives and big announcements are truly what E3 is all about. As the leading console manufacturer for this generation, Sony consistently had a strong E3 presence up to this point. While 98 was still pretty good for them, Nintendo definitely had them beat in terms of first party exclusives. That's not to say Sony didn't break out the good stuff though, we got Crash Bandicoot Warped, Siphon Filter, Twisted Metal 3... But the big one this year was Spyro the Dragon, a full 3D world to explore on PlayStation without fog, which the next generation guys were losing their minds over. Sony did have the power of the third party publisher on their side with Metal Gear Solid making its second E3 appearance, Silent Hill debuting, Final Fantasy VIII, Dead or Alive, and Parasite Eve. And with all these, it was pretty clear what console was the cream of the crop at the time. This year was just a bit less impressive than 97, but still was quite good. Sony really didn't mean business with the PlayStation, and nowhere was it more obvious than at E3. So that was just a taste of what the big three were up to this year. What about the third parties? Well, the 2006 game Prey was shown off at E3 1998. Yep, this is quite a bit different than how the game actually turned out. 3D Realms was just not in the mood to actually release a game during this era. Speaking of which, after various teases, the first video of Duke Nukem Forever, the long-awaited sequel to Duke Nukem 3D, was finally unveiled. A large chunk of the gameplay was shown running on the Quake 2 engine, and the game was intended to launch in 1999. Apparently the hot trend back in 98 was to show off games that wouldn't release for a decade. At least Half-Life was shown off and released later that year, alongside showcases for Grim Fandango, Brave Fencer Musashi, You Don't Know Jack. Yeah. <laughs> 
This year is gonna be pretty hard to beat. Yeah, Sega f***ed, but Sony, Nintendo, and so many other third parties really brought their all this year. E3 1988 would be the second and last E3 to be held in Atlanta, Georgia, and thank God, because after E3 1997, I could go without saying this E3 was held in Atlanta, Georgia for a while. Some of the greatest and most beloved games of all time, new hardware, quantity and quality, I gotta be honest, at the time, this was the best E3 yet. You learn something at every E3. 98 taught me to keep my prized possessions safe from competitors like what Sega did with the Dreamcast. I wrote piss on this gallon of milk to make sure nobody drinks it. Hey all, Scott here. After being born in 1997, I decided the next thing I wanted to do was go to E3 1999. Want proof? Well, here's the VHS tape from the event. What's up, 1999 livers? Here we are in the year 1999 at E3 1999, and if you need photographic proof, this is 1999. Gonna write that in the year 2019. See, I was there! I was also two at the time, but I was also there! Who would have thought these two things could go together? E3 1999 was totally a thing that happened from May 13th to the 15th in 1999. I should know. I was there. E3 1997 and 98 were held in Atlanta, Georgia, because why the f*** not? E3 1995 and 96 were originally held in Los Angeles, California at the LA Convention Center. And in 1999, they finally returned to their roots there, which was a far more appropriate venue for the event. Obviously because it's been the primary venue for E3 ever since. Nobody looks at this and says, I wish video games were revealed here. Now what made E3 1999 stick out from the rest? Well, how about a hearty supply of next generation systems from Sony, Sega, and Nintendo, a wrestling match at EA's booth, Donkey Kong 64, yeah that's right. As E3 evolved from its first event in 1995, it became increasingly obvious that this was the gaming event of the year. By 1999, each of the companies were trying to out-showmanship each other. It was all about trying to pull attention away from the competition. I mean, why meet Jake Lloyd at the Nintendo booth when you could catch David Bowie performing at Sony's E3 party? Why go to the WCW Mayhem wrestling match when you could stand in the Nintendo logo? Why play Thrasher Skin and Destroy when you could get a college Degree. It's almost here, the final E3 of the 90s, we're almost done, and then we can move on to talking about this one. After the last E3 1999 retrospective incident, I'm legally obligated to tell everybody we'll be rating each of the company's presence at this event on a scale of 1 to 5 knee slaps, you have been warned. Sony's presence at E3 1999 was a meaty one. They couldn't just stand there and let Sega hog all the attention with the Dreamcast. It's like the most popular kid in school felt threatened by the kid who would shove sand in his ears. Regardless, the next generation PlayStation was announced on March 1st, 1999, just a few months before E3. While the system wasn't playable at the event, they made sure you wished it was playable. Tech demos were presented at a special kiosk, graphical showcases of Gran Turismo running on PS2 hardware while Gran Turismo 2 for the PlayStation 1 was playable at E3 and was coming out later that year and the ballroom dance scene from Final Fantasy VIII running in real time on PS2 hardware while Final Fantasy VIII for the PlayStation 1 was playable at E3 and was coming out later that year. Just throwing it out there, it's a little weird they'd take games that they were trying to push for the PS1 and show vastly better looking versions of them when the original versions weren't even out yet. Wouldn't that kind of deflate the excitement for the PS1 releases? Like a month before Red Dead Redemption 2 came out, Rockstar announced Red Dead Redemption 2 HD for the PlayStation 5. Like, is that even considered a strategy? Well, these types of demos were pretty much the extent of the PS2's presence here. Uh, they showed off these demos at the E3 party hosted by Kaz Harai. You put that on the invitation, I'm already there. The bulk of the PS2 was going to be unveiled later in 1999 at Tokyo Game Show, so that meant while it was a major talking point of E3 this year, people only had tech demos to go off of, so talk was limited to, it looks great, the graphics. However, the next PlayStation wasn't the only thing Sony brought this year. We got a treasure trove of PS1 content. PS1 was in that glory days phase. It was peaking with the amount of games getting pumped out for it. This was right before next-gen hardware was going to completely take over, so this was during the time where developers really knew what the hell they were doing with the system and sales were still strong, which meant lots of games. Crash Team Racing, Ape Escape, Dino Crisis, Spyro 2, Ripto's Rage, Gran Turismo 2, Cool Borders 4, that's it, they won. Um Jammer Lammy was a huge focus for Sony this year relative to it being Um Jammer Lammy and Twisted Metal 4. Yeah, the successor to that third Twisted Metal game nobody likes and I refuse to know the actual name of. Honestly, a pretty great year for Sony. Sure, the PS2's presence was a little eh. They really didn't show off any real games or give off any major details, but with the PS1 lineup alone, this would have been a pretty great E3 for them. The PS2 tech demos were sort of the cherry on top. 
If you ever feel down about yourself, just remember, you'll always be better than Sega at E3 1998. Sure, they had the Dreamcast there, but it was only available behind closed doors and they were only showing off tech demos. The Saturn games they had on display at E3? Yeah, they were already available on store shelves. There was no point to Sega even being at E3 that year. Now, 1999 on the other hand, oh god, let's break this down. The Sega Saturn was finally everything Sega wanted it to be dead. Now it was all about the Dreamcast. At this point, the system had already launched in Japan back in November of 98. Bit of a double-edged sword if you ask me, because while that meant the system wasn't really getting its full debut here, it at least meant Sega had a huge supply of games, and on top of that, they were some of the best-looking games out there. Shenmue, Sonic Adventure, Soul Calibur, Hydro Thunder, Power Stone, Rayman 2, Sega Sports, GTA 2, Marvel vs. Capcom, yep, they did it. Sega made the Dreamcast look like pure quality and quantity. Attendees that year, such as myself, noted that while each of the big three brought tons of games, the Dreamcast's graphical capabilities put everything else to shame. The console was slated for release on September 9th, 1999 for $199. They were definitely avoiding the old E3 1995 snafu with the Saturn's price point and immediate release. I think it's fair to say this was Sega's best E3 yet. They were confident they had the best looking games of the show and they had lots of them at that. The only problem was that a lot of these games and the Dreamcast itself already released in Japan at this point. But uh, that didn't matter that much in 1999. Like I said, all three of the big companies brought with them information on their next generation systems. For Nintendo, that was Project Dolphin. A few days before E3, Nintendo announced their next system, stating it would use discs, did the printer run out of ink? Nintendo announcing Dolphin, which would later become the GameCube, felt very rushed and uneventful. Like, they felt it was necessary to do with Sony and Sega bringing their next-gen platforms, but they really didn't have much to show other than the project's existence. They basically announced what they could at the time. They were really touting that, yeah, we ain't using those things anymore. Make way for the future with DVD technology. And then Nintendo proceeded to make an ass out of themselves. They actually announced that Dolphin would play DVDs, as in, Movies. I've been trying all day, it's just not gonna work. Now, there was a Japan exclusive model of the GameCube made by Panasonic that did play DVDs, the Panasonic Q, and Panasonic was one of the partners Nintendo announced alongside the Dolphin. So with the DVDs, they didn't lie lie, but they lied. Weirdly enough, the biggest games shown off by Nintendo this year were Donkey Kong 64 and Star Wars Episode One Racer. They really pushed the Star Wars games on the N64 in general. I mean, a Stormtrooper was featured on the original N64 system box, as if it were one of the big Nintendo characters. Pokemon finally made the leap to the Nintendo 64 in the form of a what the f and Pokemon Stadium. I mean, people love some Pokemon Snap and Stadium, but these weren't full-fledged Pokemon titles. For that, Nintendo also had Pokemon Yellow at the event. They had some other portable titles, but one thing I've noticed is Nintendo normally wouldn't push their handheld stuff at E3 nearly as much as their home console games. Super Smash Bros. was being featured, even though it had already been out at this point, alongside a trio of games developed by Rare. Perfect Dark, Jet Force Gemini, and of course Donkey Kong 64. Capcom announced that they'd be bringing the original Resident Evil in all of its 3D glory to the Game Boy Color. Oh man, just think about what life would be like if that actually came out. A cool idea, but Capcom just ended up making Resident Evil Gaiden instead. Eternal Darkness was shown off for the Nintendo 64. I'm not repeating myself. Canned and eventually put on the GameCube. A few extra titles here and there, Excitebike 64, Kirby 64, Mario Golf, a solid showing from Nintendo, but nowhere near as impactful as Sony or Sega. Nintendo didn't have the sheer third-party support in a of games as Sony and didn't have the next-gen graphics the Dreamcast had. The Nintendo 64 didn't hold much of a candle to the others, and Nintendo's next system was easily the least exciting of the three due to the lack of sheer info. Not a bad showing by any means, just the least impactful. Oh god, we're in E3 1999 memorabilia country now. Well, here we have a hat from the convention. It's one of the neatest ways to get lice. But more importantly, here we have an E3 1999 press kit from Konami. Press kits are a collection of images, videos, and or information that the press gets so they can accurately write articles about announced games and also have official captures of the games to use for their websites or magazines or what have you. Nowadays, press kits are almost entirely online, but back then you'd have to extract the files from a CD. There's almost no reason to own this, but hey, it's kind of cool to look through this and step into the shoes of a lonely GameSpot editor from 1999. Inserting the disc, we get to look at old press releases. One of the main talking points here is Castlevania Resurrection, a cancelled game for the Dreamcast. And we get some really high quality pictures here. And on top of that, we get the press kit for Motocross Maniacs 2, oh Jesus. I like how international track and field has pretty solid screenshots for a Game Boy game, but then with this one, they just took a Super Game Boy and had a field day with a VCR. It's really cool to look through these things, but I have no clue how much of this is actually really cool. 
Like, how many of these screenshots and press releases are readily available online? Plus, who the hell cares what Konami had to say about NBA in the zone when that was coming out? In terms of other developers and things at the show, The Sims was there, alongside System Shock 2, Black and White, and Diablo 2, no big deal, four of the biggest PC games of all time. Oh, and Team Fortress 2, that was shown off. It wasn't available until a good eight years later, but hey, it came out and it was good. That's a miracle with video games. Final Fantasy VIII was a big one at the show, alongside the PS2 tech demo, and a couple weeks later, Final Fantasy IX was announced. What is with this timing. This was a massive E3, and not only did we get next generation systems, but tons of games for the current ones too. Sure, some of the next gen stuff was pretty bare bones and we really wouldn't get a true taste of it until next year, but it got people talking. With a handful of tragic violent events happening around the world at the time, all eyes were on E3 this year as video games were being blamed for corrupting the minds of the youth. Because of that, some of the more violent games were behind closed doors only. With all of this happening, you'd think the quality of the show would suffer, but the video game industry was becoming too big to fail. E3 1999 was just another step into becoming the E3 we know today. Well, I did it. I went over all the E3s from the 1990s, so grab your nearest cake, blow at the cigars since you don't have any candles handy, and rejoice because we only have 17 more E3s to go through. Well, this doesn't call for a celebration anymore, this calls for a coping strategy. Hey all, Scott here. Here at Give a F Productions, we deal exclusively with topics that are f giveable, and if your topic needs to find f giving, then we'll take a look at it. We don't give a f Let's see what our latest request is. Now, even we have limits. Hey everybody, I'm E3 2000. <laughs> Who the f is this guy? I laugh in the face of relevancy. Of course we're talking about E3 2000 today. What else would we do? Get out of bed? E3 2000 took place from May 11th to the 13th in 2000. And this was a bit of a transitional year in the gaming industry. One of the last major events where Sega had the audacity to live. Sony just released the PlayStation 2 in Japan and was about to announce launch details for the rest of the world. Sega's Dreamcast was struggling to make ends meet and they were starting to get desperate. Microsoft recently announced their plans to enter the gaming space and Nintendo had Lego racers for Game Boy Color. It was a hard year for PlayStation. This was Sega's last E3 as a hardware manufacturer, the last E3 before Microsoft fully stepped into the hardware ring with the Xbox, the only E3 where I have a press disc from Acclaim. Yeah, I won that yearbook superlative too. This is a product information disc given out to members of the press at E3 2000 by the game publisher Acclaim. I have a similar disc from 1999 by Konami. These discs contain info and images for journalists to utilize while writing up articles about what they saw at the event. And who doesn't give a f about what Acclaim did in 2000? You'd be surprised. Now comparing Konami in the year 1999 to Acclaim in the year 2000 is like comparing Konami to Acclaim, you know, they just don't really compare. But the fact that Acclaim is harder to give a sh about means at least I have a challenge on my hands here. Let's see if I can care. What we have here are some screenshots, videos that don't play properly, all we get here is some audio, some press releases, and fur fighters. You're welcome, me. Wait, this isn't an Acclaim press disc. This is worthless! Yeah, there's not much to this one. Still a cool piece of history, but it's not like we're changing history looking at this thing. And even if there was earth shattering information on here, do I really want to be known as the guy who unveiled Fur Fighters 2 existed? Oh, well, that was a fun waste of a disc insertion motion. I guess the only thing left to do here is to take a look at each of the major companies that took part in E3 and rate their performances on a scale of 1-5 knee slaps. Knee abuse activism is a joke. Sega, you know, the company with the name? They were starting to get desperate here. With the PS2's impending launch worldwide after already releasing in Japan, the Dreamcast future was looking bleaker and bleaker by the day. See, like, the Dreamcast had tons of amazing games, and even more that were shown off at E3 2000, but the PlayStation 2 was the PlayStation 2. Not only was it the successor to one of the best-selling consoles of all time, not only did it have brand new cutting-edge exclusives and sequels to games that shook the world on the PlayStation 1, but it could play Season 5 of Wings. You had a DVD player and something that played video games with the number 2 at the end. The Dreamcast didn't stand a chance. But Sega tried, dammit. They said, you know what, we're nearing bankruptcy, we can break a few fire codes. Sega's E3 2000 booth was the major attraction here. Not only did it shock and awe in terms of spectacle, but the games themselves. Oh, oh man, here we go. Sonic Adventure 2, Space Channel 5, Samba Day Amigo, Jet Grind Radio, Fantasy Star Online, Seaman, Shenmue, Sonic Shuffle, and the Sega Net service for the Dreamcast, being one of the driving forces behind the boom of online multiplayer. And to push the service that much more, if you signed up for Sega Net, you'd get a free Dreamcast. That's so generous, it's scary. It's like, oh, we'll give you this internet service for a small fee per month, as long as you take a Dreamcast with it. Come on, 
you. It's yours. I always considered this a last ditch effort by the company. The wait for the PlayStation 2 was really killing Dreamcast sales. They needed to do something. Many of the games that show here are some of the Dreamcast's best and define the entire system. And Sega's booth as a whole, I mean, look at all this pizzazz. They really went all out as if they were gonna die the next day. While well, Sega had an impressive showing helping to keep the Dreamcast alive in many ways, they definitely weren't the talk of the town here. The system was already a few years old. There were more exciting things on the horizon with more third-party support and the ability to play Season 6 of Wings. Which Sega knew that, which is why they showcased a DVD player add-on for the Dreamcast at the event. It never released. Bless Sega's heart, but unfortunately having the best games wasn't enough to gain everybody's attention. And thus, while this was potentially one of their best E3s, this was their last as a major player in the console race. Now, who was the talk of the town this E3? Not Microsoft, but let's discuss. I may have said Microsoft hadn't entered the console wars just yet, but they at least had a presence at E3 this year, committing themselves to the marketing, giving everybody a taste of what's to come. 20 years of disappointment. While they already revealed the Xbox project earlier that year, E3 was used to showcase a couple of games in the raw power of a shape. Yes, the prototype design of the Xbox. It's an Xbox. Mech Warrior 4, Crimson Skies, Midtown Madness 2. There was stuff, and impressive stuff, but no stuff that really stood out in comparison to what the competition was offering. I mean, Microsoft was a new player in the game. They just didn't have the appeal of Sega, Nintendo, and Sony just yet. But of course, I'm leaving out the big one. E3 2000 was where we got a full 10 minute long trailer for Halo, a shooter by Bungie. While the game was actually debuted at the 1999 Macworld Expo by Apple because IBM was busy that weekend, E3 2000 was where we got an extended look when the game was still being played in a third person perspective rather than the first person perspective of the final game. Now, if Microsoft showed off Halo, one of the biggest games of all time, the game that got people to actually give a piss about Xbox, why am I not going fucking ballistic for their presence at some press event in the year 2000? Well, one, I got distracted talking about the DS stylus for 20 minutes, and two, because Microsoft didn't show it off. A few months after E3, Microsoft acquired Bungie, and with that, it was announced Halo was to be a launch title for the Xbox, but at E3 2000, Bungie was showing off Halo all by themselves, and it was just supposed to come to the PC and Mac at the time. So, Xbox didn't have Halo yet, and while what they showed off was pretty alright, nothing truly was a showstopper. Microsoft's presence at E3 2000 was more of a see you next year sort of deal. It was a great press conference to not give a shit about. It's weird, the first major E3 Microsoft was at feels oddly similar to their modern gaming presentations. They always get really smug and go, we're gonna blow your mind, and then proceed to show off games that I forget the name of two seconds later. It's either dementia or Microsoft's just really bad at gaming presentations. There is not a Venn diagram in the world that can house both of them. It's one or the other. Nintendo! Last E3, you announced you were working on a new console. Let's see it! Hi, I'm Nintendo. I'm disappointing. E3 2000 for Nintendo was still focused on the same old, same old. Nintendo 64 and Game Boy systems. Just a few months later, Nintendo would hold their own conference to talk about their next generation systems, called Space World 2000. But what did that leave to be discussed at E3? Don't you f listen? While the Nintendo 64 hardware was, <laughs> it was looking rough by this point, there were still tons of games Nintendo was showcasing for the platform, most notably The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. On top of that, Rare's 12 Tales Conquer 64, which debuted at E3 1997, finally resurfaced as Conquer's Bad Fur Day, taking a whimsical E-rated platformer and transforming it into a urinal cake. To really highlight this, they decked out their E3 booth with an open bar for the game. The previews journalists wrote up were damn near worthless. Banjo-Tooie, Kirby 64, Paper Mario, Mario Tennis, Perfect Dark, Hey You Pikachu, Pokemon Gold and Silver, and over at Capcom's booth, they were showing off an exclusive Resident Evil game for the Nintendo 64, Resident Evil Zero. Only for the Nintendo 64. Yeah, they had a lot of good stuff here, but man, look over at Sega, they've got a Seaman. Nintendo was truly the odd man out here. Without their next generation hardware, it made them look stuck in the past and weak in comparison to what everybody else was bringing to E3 this year. Was it a bad E3 for them? No, I'm not insane. But it was a soft one overall. Not bad by any means, but they did a little too impress compared to the others. Sony, our favorite little corporation. They're making the PlayStation 2. How could they dare to get anything but five knee slaps? Please don't. Well, Sony was definitely the talk of the town this year with the PS2 releasing soon. This was the next generation console. They had the fan base, the support, and the technology to really push public opinion in their favor. They paid Frankie Muniz to go to E3 to play video games for PlayStation Underground. They meant business. So what did Sony show off? Not Lego racers for Game Boy Color. I know that. The PS2 lineup? 
I don't know, it was kind of underwhelming. The big showstopper, no doubt, was Metal Gear Solid 2. It was being shown off on this ass big screen on the show floor and it got everybody's attention. Of course, with that game being exclusive to the PlayStation 2, Sony gets a point for that. But what else was really being shown for the system at this event? Gran Turismo, Fantavision, Dark Cloud, Eco, Armored Core 2, Oddworld Munch's Odyssey, but that ended up being exclusive to the Xbox. Yes, again, many of these were good games, but it just isn't that exciting of a lineup. I feel like the Nintendo 64 games had more to them than most of this. Sega had a better roster of games being shown and they were hooked up to a breathing tube. The PS2's launch window games just weren't these you gotta play it games, but it didn't matter. The games were good enough and the aura around the concept of a PlayStation 2 in general was great enough that nobody cared. They just wanted a PlayStation 2 at that point. The price point of $2.99 and a release date of October 26th was announced alongside 51 games to be released by the holiday season. Not a bad showing, but nothing major enough to make this not pretty lackluster for the PS2's first major E3. Wow. That was one of the worst E3s that could have possibly happened in the year 2000. Wasn't bad, but just sort of a soft year. Sure, Sega was good, but do you remember the dead guy for holding a good E3? No, you remember from being f***ing dead. Like I said, this was definitely a transitional year. Sony was still showing off a bunch of PlayStation 1 games, Microsoft barely had anything to show yet, Nintendo forgot they were even making a new console, but from what I've noticed, that year or so before a new generation starts is almost always a bit mediocre. And E3 2000, was definitely mediocre. Though next year we should have new consoles to look at and one less Sega to talk about and without E3 2000 we wouldn't get to that point so that has got to make E3 2000 worth giving a f over. I tried okay? Hey y'all, Scott here. So it's about that time. Let's have the talk. Let's talk about birds, bees, hell, beef and sex. I've gone across the country teaching the proper education professionally, and I've learned it all from this here book. So let's start with chapter one, Luigi's Mansion. I gotta make some calls. It's finally that time of the year! E3 2001 occurred from May 17th to the 19th in 2001 at the Los Angeles Convention Center as any E3 2001 would. And this year for gaming as a whole had some of the most iconic releases of all time. Massive console launches like the GameCube, Game Boy Advance, Xbox, the PlayStation 2 was still in its first year on the market and Sega finally did the right thing! Give up! Every couple of years we hit one in the industry where Everything happens. All the games released, new consoles launch, and the only year that I think even remotely matches 2001 it would be 2013. But even then, I think overall, 2001 may have been the biggest year for video games of all time. God, Scott, stop sucking the year off! Well, let's dive into what occurred at E3 2001, and as per usual, I'll be rating each major company's presence at the show on a scale of 1 to 5 neat slaps. Let's start with a company that needs no introduction. Final few years of the Nintendo 64, well, they sure were years. We did get some amazing games during this time, but they were going up against the launch of the Dreamcast and PlayStation 2 alongside all the titles coming out for the 10 times as popular PlayStation 1. Dr. Mario 64, brace yourselves, wasn't gonna cut it. And looking back at the history of E3s, the past few years really felt like Nintendo was spinning their wheels. While other companies were pushing forward with new tech, and Nintendo was saying, no, -uh, we have a new console. All right, can we see it? You can see Mario Party 3. The 64 was just kind of of in existence for a while now, but E3 2001 was Nintendo's first E3 show for not only the GameCube, but the Game Boy Advance as well. Yeah, read off that spiral notebook. This isn't a press conference, it's a book report. We're still in that era of press conferences where press conferences were press conferences, damn it. For some reason going on about how the GameCube has a shot against the competition via graphs. Well, this graph would have more value if you show me the games that would give it a shot against the competition. This conference had the theme of the Nintendo difference. What are you, a brand of paper towel? Now, according to Nintendo, the Nintendo difference is this. An absolute fetish for quality. Hey, guy, what's your fetish? Uh, well, quality, quantity, the pursuit of happiness, ass and chips. Satoru Iwata comes on stage just a year before he became president of Nintendo, discussing how games all look the same and really leans into the Nintendo difference. Now, over on Nintendo, in comparison, it's all about innovation and quality. They released this a month prior. Miyamoto comes out on stage and holy sh**, he's one hand in that bitch. Bill Trennan accompanies them for translation and introduces the first game with the concept of trying to figure out what characters to bring to GameCube first. <laughs> Kind of 
physicality. Super Smash Brothers Melee revealed to the world with the opening cutscene and a short overview of the characters. They don't spend long on it considering you get the general idea of what this is by reading the title. Melee's reveal will forever be one of the best E3 moments, as you can tell just how giddy and excited the audience is. Watching it now is like opening a time capsule, and whenever Samus appeared, everybody roared since this was during a large gap between Metroid games. Zelda and Sheik were given a huge applause compared to the one guy recognizing ice climbers. Scientists studied this man afterwards. How does one man remember that much ice climber? Melee was the Smash Brothers series transition from a fun party fighter to a massive gaming event. The bombastic orchestral music, Gorgeous graphical upgrade, iconic characters paired up with those who haven't seen the light of day in ages. Melee's reveal was the perfect introduction to GameCube, and also showed this console was hopeless. You practically launch a system with a game that invokes this kind of reaction and it gets third place? This marked a change in consoles. It was no longer enough to have the best exclusive games. You had to have multimedia features or a gimmick, and the GameCube? had a calendar. After Smash, we get a look at what's called the next in the Mario series. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the next in the Mario series. So I like Luigi's Mansion, but the way it was shown here felt more like a joke. And I think a lot of critics had this feeling towards Luigi's Mansion when it first launched. The stigma that it was lame as shit. You're not getting a Mario platformer at launch, you're getting his drippy nose brother with a shop back. As time went on, I think everybody's come to appreciate this game a whole lot more. But at E3 2001, the main thing Nintendo pushed with it was how it utilized the GameCube's capabilities. They showed off the controller, which the Wavebird has a different button layout from the wired one. Why do that? The game discs, which Nintendo bragged about being severely anti-piracy as a selling point. Here's our product, and the best part about it is you can steal it. The GameCube startup is shown prior to the Luigi's Mansion demo and gets applause. As it should. And we get a demo for Luigi's Mansion, which again was created to show off the GameCube's capabilities. Dual analog control along with tons of elemental effects. It was impressive, no doubt, but the fact it wasn't a Mario game and was a Luigi game just made it kind of lame for many. It's pretty shallow that various people thought that way, but that's what the general consensus was at the time. And the way they showed it off here, well fine, I think undersold the game quite a bit, even if it looked very graphically impressive. Interestingly, they state right after the demo how the Game Boy Advance can be used as a GameCube controller, but the way they talked about it implied it would work with Luigi's Mansion, which would have made sense. I mean, you have the Game Boy Horror in the game to have a map screen on the Game Boy screen at all times would have been handy. But no, they just move on to more graphs and Spec talk, which is very unlike Nintendo. What is like Nintendo is to show us something we can't have. Damn. The Panasonic Q, the Japanese only GameCube with the DVD player was shown here for Spice? They just kind of show it like this is for the Japanese market, so I don't think they ever really had plans to bring it over here. But they also had it on display at the E3 2001 show floor. If I had to guess, even if they were never going to sell it in the US, just having a GameCube with DVD playing capabilities at the show would be enough for people to think the GameCube was actually worth a damn. It, yeah, you can play DVDs on it, you just uh need to be able to deadlift 400 pounds. Some developers are shown in a video talking about the GameCube, namely Silicon Knights, Rare, and Retro Studios, all showing off games that were barely real. Retro had Ravenblade! I yeah, sure, honey, I'm on the phone. Rare had Cameo and Donkey Kong Racing, but titles like Metroid Prime, Eternal Darkness, and Star Fox Adventures were displayed, with Star Fox Adventures having the subtitle of Dinosaur Planet. This is awesome to see in the context of an actual press conference. For so long, I've only known of the origins of Star Fox Adventures through articles or random trailers, but actually seeing it alongside Donkey Kong Racing and Ravenblade at E3 shows, it's pretty wild and gives a much better idea as to how these games were positioned back then. Next up, we have a brand new game from Nintendo. What the hell was that? Nintendo announced Pikmin as their next Pokemon in the sense that it may not make sense now, but just you wait. Give it some time. A quick demo is shown, and Miyamoto says that he got the idea of Pikmin from gardening. You're selling a console! The GameCube is set to launch on November 5th in North America, September 14th in Japan, and 2002 in Europe to the audible disappointment of the audience. Liar! It actually ended up launching on the 18th in North America, but I'll let this one slide due to the sizzle reel at the end. Star Wars Rogue Leader, Raven Blade, Wave Race BS, NBA Courtside 2002, Donkey Kong Racing, Animal Force for GameCube. Interestingly, they announced this a month after the game launched on the Nintendo 64 in Japan. Metroid Prime, Mario Kart for GameCube, just using Smash Brothers character models and go-karts. Mickey for GameCube. All right. The delay was worth it. Ending things on that infamous Zelda for GameCube demo, showing a realistic Link and Ganondorf fighting. 
To which one year later, we got a puppet show instead. Why wasn't any of this sprinkled throughout the press conference? Instead we got, did you know the GameCube is going to do well? Well, if you showed me Mickey for GameCube earlier, that wouldn't be a question. There's quite a lot to like about this showing, though interesting to note, Nintendo barely talked about the Game Boy Advance. For that, you'd have to check out the show floor. This giant screen saying, fun fact, to ensure innovation, we employ the strongest and most successful exclusive game development resources in the world. That's not a fact, that's just smug. I love this rotating actual GameCube logo and the Game Boy Advance demo units showing games like Mario Kart Super Circuit, F-Zero Maximum Velocity, Wario Land 4, this was a damn good show. Though their presentation seems better on paper because when you actually watch it, and more innovation will be on display when our Space World exhibition brings me right back to economics class. It may have felt like there were a lot of games, but it was primarily just Smash Brothers, Luigi's Mansion, and Pikmin. Everything else was just sort of thrown in a scissor reel. They still did a good job impressing, and that's more evident by taking a look at the show floor, though Nintendo just didn't show much that clawed people away from the PlayStation 2, unfortunately. Yeah, Smash Brothers looked amazing, but did that make up for the relative lack of third-party support? To some, yeah, and I think something big Nintendo proved this E3 was a massive change to their software output. That slowed down to a crawl on Nintendo 64, but with the GameCube, they showed off a ton of exclusive games in development, most of which came out within the first year or two. Nintendo in 2001, keep it up. Well, let's take a breather in the form of E3 2001 memorabilia. These Activision 02 hats were given out. Activision 02 was a sub-brand they used for their sports games. Cause sports require oxygen. Well. That was fun. Let's move on to Sony. Let's see how good boy PlayStation did this year. They have the best selling console of all time. Again, so why even try? Well, Kaz arrived. Just stepped off the golf course. It's crazy to see these iconic Sony executives there so long ago. Uh, Jack Trenton, Andrew House, the king's all here, which means their first announcement must be big. First rule debut, a DVD wireless remote. I stand corrected huge. Gran Turismo 3 gets a trailer even though it's already been out in Japan. Jack and Daxter gets a trailer and demo being the big holiday title for the PS2 that year being poised as the PlayStation 2's Crash Bandicoot. But who gives a sh when the PS1 LCD screen is announced? I think it says right here. The PS1 is still a lucrative piece of Sony's business. While the show is all about PS2, they still intended on giving their first console some proper support. Sony's done that with all of their consoles. Even when the PS4 came out, they released Gran Turismo 6 exclusively on the PS3 a month later. They highlight that Square will remain exclusive to PlayStation consoles consoles for the time being, which showcased how powerful this partnership was at the time. But with all this power and having the most successful console out at the time, that meant 10 minutes of EA Sports. Wow, Madden 2002's on the PlayStation 2, these mad sons of bitches finally did it! If this was the first Madden on PS2 or on this generation of game systems in general, I'd understand a gameplay demo for the conference. Final Fantasy X is shown, like, my god, can you believe how fast they were pumping these games out at the time? Final Fantasy was practically a yearly series at this point. 7, 8, and 9 coming out one after another made some sense with them all being on the same console, but 10 was for the PlayStation 2 and still released just a year after 9. They show a movie trailer for Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within. Then we dive into some other big PS2 exclusives, a long, long speech about Devil May Cry, then onto Silent Hill 2, and finally a trailer for Metal Gear Solid 2, which was pretty much E3's darling game at this point. Grabbing everybody's attention, this was the killer app for the time. They end things off with some accessories, a PS2 network adapter and hard drive along with an LCD screen, keyboard, and mouse for... Who did this? I have never seen the PlayStation 2 marketed as a straight up desktop PC. They say this is for email. This! They also show a bit of SOCOM kind of to push the online capabilities of the console. With the Xbox looming over, that was smart to do considering that system was far ahead of the PS2 in terms of internet connectivity. Yeah, you know, Sony did have some of the biggest names on their side and just looking at their booth, it's quite obvious not only did they have the biggest names, they had all the names. The amount of games on display for PS2 was staggering, and while Nintendo gave you a reason to check out their stuff, Sony gave you a reason to buy their stuff. The PS2 obviously had a tremendous future in front of it. They were even talking about streaming HD movies to the console. This, I may be a Nintendo, we'll say fan, and while E3 2001 had a lot to make me happy, it was also obvious who was gonna truly win this generation. Let's return to E3 memorabilia. Here we have an E3 2001 program giving out on the second day of the event. It's designed as if it's a magazine, featuring advertisements that look ripped right out of one, except they're actively begging you to check their booth at E3 out. This is absolutely fascinating. Reading articles detailing the announcement of Kingdom Hearts, which, yeah, debuted here, in a match made in gamer heaven. 
If only. Articles detailing Xbox and Nintendo's booths, giving attendees the motivation to keep it up. What other companies have brought to the show, whether it's games, hardware, accessories. There's interviews, conference schedules, maps, the Mario Awards. Nintendo of America would award their retail partners with Mario Awards based on categories like their catalog, magazine, promotions, in-store flyers. That gave good motivation to advertise Nintendo. See, we could put the PlayStation there, but we're neck and neck with Sears here. Do Wario. Hell, even advertisements for DVD scratch removal machines are here. This entire thing feels like I'm where I don't belong. Shuttle services and food options. Namco is outright begging for applicants. This is an awesome piece of E3 history that truly does give you the feeling of actually being there. It's a little big though. But what's this? Xbox? Who's that? While Microsoft had a presence at E3 2000, 2001 was the year of the system's launch and gave us a much better idea of what we could expect. The console's design was finalized, making it much more consumer friendly. Oh, come on, that's a choking hazard. And a little game called Halo, which was shown last year, went from a third person game for PC and Mac to a first person shooter launching exclusively with Xbox. This was always the go-to game for Xbox, as outside of that, it was a pretty mediocre show for them. They were still in the peach fuzz era of understanding gaming. They got it much more than other companies did, but this was their first console, so the hiccups were to be expected. However, going against Nintendo and Sony, Microsoft had a few technical problems during their conference and not nearly as many games on display. They had Dead or Alive 3 as an exclusive for launch alongside Oddworld Munch's Odyssey. Racing games like Project Gotham and NASCAR Heat impressed, but Microsoft's booth was half Xbox and half PC gaming. The launch date of November 8th, 2001 for North America was announced. Liar! November 15th, and a launch in Japan would occur before Europe, which many people already knew was a mistake. The Xbox has famously never done well in Japan. Many knew the Japanese market wouldn't take to Xbox, but Microsoft sure wanted them to considering modern gaming was practically born in Japan. But all this did was waste Microsoft's time by launching in Japan before Europe and piss off customers in Europe because they had to wait longer. All for a retail price of $299, which was fairly expensive, though with the Xbox being the most powerful of the main three consoles and with Halo as the killer app, it sufficed. But it's pretty clear, without Halo, this would have been a pretty weak showing, but Microsoft came out swinging with one of the most iconic launch titles of all time. That's gotta count for something. Grand Theft Auto 3. Yeah, there was quite a lot more to this E3 than just what the big three brought to the table. Namely, Rockstar brought the big three. I even have the final part of E3 2001 memorabilia, the sticker they gave out. All right, yep, take a look at that. Okay. Duke Nukem Forever made another appearance, this time looking quite a bit different from the last time we saw it. This one showcasing how truly expansive the game was going to be. Look at all these environments, characters, things to do, epic music. None of it ever happened. Sega was everywhere this year, making deals all over the place with the announcement that Dreamcast would be fizzling and Sega as a company would become a third party. Each console manufacturer made a deal to get a certain Sega franchise on it exclusively, most notably Sonic on Nintendo. The sheer amount of massive industry-defining games to come out of this E3 is unprecedented. Prior years felt like growing pains, but E3 2001 truly does feel like where E3 became E3 from there on out. Wait a second. No, I'm just confused.